Well, let's um, move on to um, just some brief uh, definitions. Sorry, I'll just go back a step. Um, globalization. What is globalization? Well, it's a very complex and multifaceted process. Um, and uh, it's very difficult to produce any definitions which are not reductionist. Uh, but with that caveat, the main focus of globalization in this talk will be the way that it involves the liberalization and the expansion of markets, a reorganization of political authority, and an increasingly rapid transmission of ideas and cultural flows within and across states. And uh, for the purposes of this lecture, globalization uh, accelerated after the collapse of communist rule in the late 1980s. It's both a process as well as a set of uh, political projects. Uh, by governance, I don't mean governance without government because there is usually a public and a private face to governance processes and ultimately governments pass laws and implement them. But global governance, I think, entails both public and private forms of power and institutions in both state and civil society or political and civil society. Uh, and it operates at different scales, local, national, regional, global. Um, and it's a process that involves ideas that justify or legitimate political power, institutions through which in influence is stabilized and reproduced, and patterns of incentives and sanctions to ensure compliance with rules, regulations, standards, procedures, norms, <coughs> etc. Civil society. Well, the first thing about civil society is that civil society is something which is most developed in liberal state formation. And in fact, the origins of civil society, as we understand it today, could be traced back to the origins of uh, uh, the emergence of liberal states. For example, the English Revolution in the 17th century. It involves a voluntary sphere where consent is generated, and on one level, the existing order is le legitimized and reproduced politically. But it's also a site where new forces can emerge, whether they're progressive or reactionary, to challenge and indeed to transform the existing order. So it is um, a terrain which both reinforces and serves to transform uh, uh, existing orders. And insofar as that there is a global civil society, <coughs> it's, it's a sphere that includes and cross-cuts the national or regional forms of civil society in a very uneven way across different parts of the globe. And we can discuss that unevenness if people wish to do. But in my definition of civil society, the counterpart term is political society. But if we think about the major agents in civil society, we cannot exclude from our definition um, uh, transnational corporations, media complexes, and churches. Uh, they operate across, in and across many jurisdictions. Um, and um, they're involved in various things, right down to the, every, the moments of everyday life in the, in, 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 in the sponsorship of sports, uh, community activities. Uh, they influence and, sh and tend to shape the way that these activities carry out. So my definition differs from those who see civil society as somehow how being a sphere that's between the state and market. Uh, it's much more complex, I think, than that uh, proposition would suggest. So the lecture's in five parts. First, the or the I, will, I will link those, those definitions to the origins of the terms as I see them. Secondly, to highlight the key forces in global civil society that I see today. Uh, to link these to this, this new period of political contestation that I alluded to. Third, to show the clash involves both forces from above and forces from below, not in some simple sense. It's a very complex interactive process that's, uh, that's at work. Um, and fourth, to isolate some aspects of global governance which are partly at issue. Um, the, um, the main aspects that I want to try and highlight are um, connected to what I call the new constitutionalism, which is a kind of legal and political and juridical framework which involves the reshaping of both national constitutional orders and the transnational frameworks which serve to constitute those orders. It creates a kind of form of legal globalization or transnational force field of, 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 of incentives and constraints, um, um, which is central to the reproduction of, of, of key aspects of globalization today. So that is the, 
aspects of global governance I particularly want to focus on. And finally, I want to look at the prospects for progressive forces and the way in which they relate to the prospects for um, um, humane forms of global governance. Now, going back to the uh, way in which my work relates to this, I just want to um, remind you about the book that I mentioned, the Cambridge University book, uh, American Hegemony and the Trilateral Commission. It enabled me to see how uh, global power didn't simply involve the relations between states. It involved relations between very important private forces um, in um, 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 civil society that engaged in initiatives concerned with the shaping of governance. In other words, it involved a range of social forces that weren't simply restricted to or allegiant to particular national territories, although there was that kind of identity. Um, the, in the work that I did on global political economy, I identified the main, as it were, formation of globalization from above, which I called the G7 nexus. Namely, the, the states and important a, the, the, the more internationalized aspects of, of states or governments that interfaced with the more internationalist oriented elements of civil society and in particular business interests. Um, and I call this the, the G7 nexus. And that G7 nexus throughout the 1990s was, was concerned to expand market forces and to uh, create um, greater, what, the, what economists call, greater market disciplines. Uh, and the justification for this is it will, pro it will produce greater economic growth and welfare. And I call this the, um, the emergence of disciplinary neoliberalism. The discipline of market forces was crucial to um, that kind of, uh, the reproduction of that type of governance. The second thing was, well, how could this form of governance be, um, be, be fully constituted? And uh, I developed the notion of, of constitutive or structural power. Um, and I connected that to, this is work that I did in the 1990s, to the way that the period coincided with the emergence of new liberal constitutions and political institutions, uh, regulations and patterns of global governance, uh, whereby what was being constituted were the frameworks within which normal politics and economic interactions could take place. Um, so it was a very fundamental reconstitution of the rules of the political game, which was highlighted most clearly in the transformation of the constitutional orders and the forms of political economy in Eastern Europe in the former communist states. That literally, their communist frameworks were replaced by liberal ones. But it was a worldwide process. And I call this the new constitutionalism. Um, and um, the... The, the, the third, and, and from this, um, I began to look at the way in which politics began to reform about concerning contestation about some of these and other related issues connected to globalization. And I called this the, uh, um, the, the, the clash of um, globalization's hypothesis, which I tried to contrast with uh, that of Huntington, the so-called clash of civilization's thesis which saw the main fault line of global politics through a revised Cold War geopolitical lens. My notion of clash of, uh, clash of, of, of uh, uh, globalizations cross-cuts particular civilizational complexes as he defined them. It's both inside and outside and across um, uh, that kind of lens. Uh, 